Uh, good evening, everybody. We will start our December 16, 2020 planning and zoning meeting. Uh, first item on our agenda is roll call. Chairman Chernick. Here. Commissioner Height. Is present. Commissioner Teta. Here. Commissioner Poland. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Here. Commissioner Flagg. Commissioner Flagg. Commissioner Honoron. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. Um, next on our agenda, I need to let anybody who wishes to speak know that during, uh, <laughs> anybody wishing to speak during the public invited to be heard items, which are items four and seven, or during any public hearing items, which is agenda item six, you'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting for instructions about how to call in to provide public comment at the appropriate times. Instructions will be given during the meeting and displayed on the screen, like you see right now, when it is time to call in to provide comments. Comments are limited to five minutes per person, and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. And I'm going to add that public invited to be heard items are those uh, comments you want to make that are not about an agenda item on the meeting. Um, please uh, keep your comments about agenda items to the public hearing part of that agenda item. Third on our agenda tonight is communications. We have uh, Assistant City Manager Joni Marsh and our new Planning Director, uh, Glenn Van Neemwegen. Um Joni, would you like to introduce Glenn to the group and um, then maybe a few comments from Glenn? Sure, good evening, Commissioners, Chairman Chernak. Uh, it's nice to be here with all of you. I think it was a year ago when I informed you that I wasn't going to be here anymore with you. And uh, um, much like most things in 2020, that didn't exactly turn out the way I had planned. Um, the planning department has had four frozen positions since the pandemic began. Um, I'm fortunate enough to say that as of uh, this last week, we do have a new planning director, Glenn, and I am happy to welcome him and um, start the new year with a, a planning director at the helm, and I'll turn it over to Glenn. Well, thank you, Joni. Uh, believe me, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's nice to meet all the commissioners. I wish we could be in person. And I guess that's my hope for the new year is um, maybe at some point we can all be in the same physical space. But um, I do come into the position with uh, um, quite a bit of experience. I like to say I'm 30 years old with 30 years experience. Um, a good portion of that in the Phoenix area, I worked for about four different municipalities um, in the Phoenix metro area. And then the recession hit and um, that was our chance to escape and, and uh, move to Colorado. So in Colorado, I've uh, worked for the cities of Littleton. Um, I took a bit of a um, um, chance and uh, worked for uh, Mountain Village. If any of you have skied and tell you ride, you might be familiar with Mountain Village. Um, and then most recently, my adopted hometown of the city of Salida. But um, I was introduced to Longmont um, back when I was in um, um, Littleton. And um, believe me, it's stuck in my head is um, that's a place where I'd like to be. So believe me, I am thrilled to be here and hope to get to know you all a little bit better. Great, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, welcome to Longmont, Glenn. Glad to thank have you here. Um, next on our agenda item uh, is item number four, public invited to be heard for any, anything uh, that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, we'll display the call-in information so you can see that. Uh, Eric is getting that, there we go. The information is being displayed on the screen uh, for you from home. Please dial 1-888-788-0099. It's toll free in the United States. When prompted, enter the meeting ID 831-5380-9801. And when asked for your participant ID, press the pound sign. When we are ready to hear public comment, we'll call you uh, we'll call on you to speak based on the 
last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record and will be allowed five minutes to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. To get everybody who wants to speak into uh, the meeting, we need uh, five minutes to do this. So we will now take a five minute break.
All right, Chairman, it doesn't look like we have any numbers for uh, public invited to be heard. Okay, thank you, Erica. Um, so we can, okay. Thank you for taking down the screen. Um, next on our agenda is approval of the minutes um, from the October 21, 2020 meeting. Um, anybody have any discussion? Any motion to approve the minutes? Commissioner Height? I'd move to approve the, um, what are these? The October 21st, 2020 minutes. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second on that motion? Commissioner Oneron, second. Yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approval, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, those opposed? Those who need to abstain because they weren't at the meeting? Okay. So Jane, two abstentions, no, no opposition, and the rest is approved. So it's Teta, Flag, Oneron, Height, and Poland have approved. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next is a public hearing item and it's item six on our agenda, the Modern West Concept Plan Amendment, PZR 2020-8 with Principal Planner Brian Schumacher leading the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Erica and Jane, can you please start the staff presentation slides? Yes, give me just a sec here. Thank you. There it is. It wasn't showing up on my, my little thing here. All right, thanks, thanks, Erica. Appreciate it. Good evening, commissioners. It's good to see you all again. I'm Brian Schumacher with Planning Development Services, and tonight is the public hearing for the Modern West Concept Plan Amendment. So this slide, next slide, please. Sorry, sorry, Erica. Uh, this slide notes staff that are available for questions this evening. Myself, uh, Caroline is available to respond to traffic related questions and David is available to respond to any airport related questions the commission might have. After the presentations and public hearing comments, the applicant representatives and staff are available to respond to questions. Next slide, please. So this slide just provides a quick overview of the parcel location in Southwest Longmont. North of Nelson Road, south of Rogers Road, east of Airport Road, west of Anderson Street, and it's adjacent, immediately adjacent to the Anderson RV storage facility. Next slide, please. This slide just shows the property's proximity to the Vance Brand Airport and the alignment of the runway. Next slide, please. Just a few notes on this slide regarding zoning and the applicant will provide more details regarding some of the surrounding so zones as part of their presentation. So on this slide, I don't know if it's uh, easy to see, but Modern West is shown with the red star. Uh, airport is the parcel in blue to the Northwest on the west side of Airport Road. The airport influence overlay uh, is an area that's encompassed by the oval on the zoning map, if you can see that on the display. And then uh, Modern West property is zoned mixed use employment. And then as noted on here for the properties that are already annexed, uh, this Modern West property is surrounded by other parcels and properties with mixed use employment zoning. And then there's also a couple of other parcels on the south end that are not yet annexed, but they have mixed use employment land use designation on the Envision Longmont land use plan. Next slide, please. So this just provides a brief summary of prior planning and actions by the city. And the property has been part of the Longmont area comprehensive plan and has been planned for urban development since the, some of the original neighborhood planning in this area in the 1980s. Uh, some of you on the commission may have reviewed the annexation that went through the review process. I believe it went to the commission in 2018 and it was recorded for annexation into the city in 2019. And then the concept plan that was approved at the time of annexation included only light industrial uses at the time. Next slide, please. 
So this just provides a brief outline of the primary components of this request for the concept plan amendment. Again, the applicant is going to provide more details regarding their proposal as part of their presentation. But just to note a few things, um, as I noted on the previous slide, the original concept plan was for just light industrial. This proposal is for a mix of light industrial, commercial, and mixed residential uses. There's also a planned collector street on the north side of the property, which is Mountain Brook Drive, that'll extend from Anderson Street on the east over to Rogers Road to the west. There's also a future local street connection along the west side of this property that'll eventually connect down to Nelson Road. There also likely be an emergency access along the narrow parcel that's along the south side of this property. And then there are also plans for pedestrian connections, internal and two external paths as part of future development of the property. Next slide, please. So just a few notes about the proposed development phasing of the property. Uh, the phasing plan shows light industrial and commercial uses on the west side and northern side to be developed first with Mountain Brook Drive, that collection street on the north side, uh, making the connection to Anderson Street to the east and Rogers Road to the west with the initial phases of development. And then the mixed residential, which is kind of on the western side of the parcel, will be included during later phases of development of the property. And as I mentioned, the local street along the west side that will connect to Nelson Road um, with a future phase of development. And then also the emergency access, as I mentioned before, also along that northern narrow corridor to that will provide a connection down to Nelson Road. Next slide, please. So these next few slides outline some of the topics that were discussed during the DRC review prior to the hearing being scheduled. So I'm going to touch upon a few of these topics um, that were outlined in more detail in the staff communication. So the first one is related to airport impacts and the land use mix. And as part of the review process and actually prior to the application submittal as part of the pre-application discussions, staff had discussed with the applicant potential impacts of proximity to the airport, particularly as it related to residential development. And through the conversations that we've had with the applicant, the applicant intends to work with the city so that the airport operations are not compromised by future development on this property, uh, given its proximity to the airport and the airport runway. A couple of things of note, uh, the future development on the property will be subject to the airport influence overlay zone and the FAA regulations and compliance with the airport influence overlay and the FAA regulations will address a few things, uh, such as electrical interference, impairing visibility. You know, an example might be if uh, this project's very interested in uh, having a net zero energy impact. And so uh, one thing that they'd be looking at is potential solar panels. And so just need to take a look at reflectivity of those solar panels and make sure they're not having an adverse impact on, on aircraft flights uh, approaching the, uh, the airport. A few other things would be just otherwise uh, other factors that might create a hazard or endanger aircraft, as well as uh, some of the height restrictions related to the airport airspace. And as noted in the email and the, and the letter that was provided by the FAA, regarding the airspace analysis that the applicant had submitted to the FAA for a preliminary review. And then the applicant is also, um, will also grant a navigation easement to the city as part of um, future development and, and subdivision planning. And the granting of a navigation easement will acknowledge a few things. One, obviously the activities and noise associated with airport operations. Uh, the right of passage over the property by aircraft, as well as restrictions regarding the height of structures or other objects on the property so that it doesn't impede into that airspace that's restricted by FAA regulations. Next slide, please. So in terms of environmental protections, and that's typically one of the criteria associated with uh, any application and concept plans, uh, a habitat and species conservation plan was submitted with the application. 
and it did not identify any threatened or endangered species or habitat or wetlands or waters of the U.S. subject to federal regulation or local regulations. Natural resource staff did review the uh, habitat and species conservation plan and they generally agreed with the findings and recommendations from the plan and they did note some recommendations regarding bird nest mitigation procedures that will be followed prior to construction with future phases of development such as going through the subdivision process as well as site planning for future development. Next slide please. There is also an environmental site assessment that was submitted. It's the same assessment that was provided through the annexation process. And staff was okay with the, uh, the 2017 assessment since nothing really has changed on the property since it was annexed. And the environmental site assessment indicated that there was no evidence of enviro environmental conditions on the property that would require additional investigation. Next slide, please. So in terms of traffic and roadway improvements, the development of the property is not expected to have an adverse impact on the level of service and the transportation benchmark. And this will be reviewed again uh, with the future preliminary subdivision plat as the plan is more refined. And roadway improvements will include, as I mentioned before, connections to the Collector Street on the north side to Anderson Street to the east and Rogers Road to the west. And Modern West will also participate in the future traffic signal improvements at the Rogers Road and Airport Road intersection. And any additional improvement requirements will be addressed at the time of future subdivision and development. Next slide, please. So as, as we went through the review process, we talked about a few other things such as infrastructure considerations for future development. And those will be required to comply with municipal code requirements at the time of subdivision platting and site planning review. Things such as multimodal and pedestrian connections, utility improvements, including storm drainage and water quality design. Uh, it appears that utility capacity is anticipated to be adequate and emergency response times will comply with the city's benchmark. Obviously the fire station number uh, five is nearby at the intersection of airport and Nelson Road. And there are more details in the communication on each of these topics if uh, the commission has uh, questions about this. Next slide, please. So this slide just outlines instances where there have been and will continue to be opportunities for public input on this project. Uh, the neighborhood meeting was held back about a year ago in December 2019. Uh, the notice of application occurred in May of this year. The notice of the public hearing was sent out in early December. Obviously, we're here tonight for the public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, this application will be forwarded on to City Council and there will be a notice to surrounding property owners for the public hearing with City Council in early January. And then the City Council public hearing will likely be held in late January. Uh, sorry, that should be 2021. Sorry about that uh, for the uh, notice and the hearing with city council. And then um, once the concept plan amendment, assuming it gets approved, gets through the process, obviously there will be additional opportunities through the subdivision plat and site plan review process for the public to have opportunities on, on future design for this site as well. Next slide, please. So throughout the review process, we've only received one public comment and that includes, um, well, I will say through the neighborhood meeting, there were some questions and general comments regarding kind of the process and the timing of construction and things of that nature, but there weren't really any substantive questions or concerns raised at the neighborhood meeting. So the one uh, public comment that had some substance was uh, expressing some concern with traffic and the timing of some of the Nelson Road improvements. And uh, a couple of emails that we received recently, uh, emails of support of the project were also received and those were forwarded to the commission. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of the review process, uh, staff sends out uh, the proposal to outside agencies to see if they have any questions or concerns or comments on the proposal. So we did receive some 
uh, feedback back from the school district and they confirmed that none of the schools, at least at this time, that would serve this development are near the school capacity benchmark. Uh, so future preliminary and final subdivision plats and site plans, those will be reviewed by the school district again to make sure and confirm that there's adequate school capacity when the property is closer to development. Uh, staff also did receive a, an email that was forwarded to the commission for the Lama Economic Development Partnership that was uh, submitted for it that uh, provided support for the project. And then also forwarded to the commission was an email as well as a letter from the FAA that indicated that they had reviewed the applicant's airspace analysis submittal and made it a preliminary determination of no hazard to air navigation based on the anticipated and expected future building heights for development on this property. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just includes a few procedural notes. Uh, so as noted, the applicant is responsible for demonstrating that the application meets the applicable review criteria and municipal code standards. And they will, as part of their presentation, they will address the criteria in more detail. The Plan Zoning Commission is a recommending body for a concept plan amendment, and the commission's recommendation will be forwarded to City Council, Council's decision-making body on this, this application. Next slide, please. So based on staff's analysis of the review criteria, as noted in the communication, staff found the application to meet the criteria and is recommending approval as noted in PZ Resolution 2028A. Next slide, please. So this slide just outlines the next steps for tonight's hearing. We'll have the applicant's presentation next. The commission will open up a public hearing to see if there's members of the public that would like to speak this evening. After the public hearing, the commission will have opportunities to ask questions of the applicant or staff based on the public hearing comments or questions that the commission may have. And the commission will deliberate on the matter, and then the commission will take a motion and a vote on the item. And uh, that will conclude uh, tonight's hearing. So with that, uh, Barb Brunk will be presenting for the applicant. And next slide, please. Just wanna say thank you commissioners and Eric and Jane for your help this evening. And that concludes my presentation comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. So we'll move on to uh, Ms. Brunk. Good evening, Chairman Chernak and Commissioners. I'm Barb Brunk, Resource Conservation Partners, PO Box 1522, Longmont, Colorado. I'm so excited to be here this evening to talk to you again about the Modern West Project. Um, I'm really the storyteller this evening. Derek Rossio has assembled a team to develop and implement his vision for a unique, sustainable, energy efficient, integrated mixed com use community in Longmont. Derek is the landowner applicant and keeper of the vision for the project. We also have key members of the design team here this evening to answer questions as they come up. Aaron Bagnell from Sofa Spar and Architects, Cara Carmichael from the Rocky Mountain Institute, Shanti Pless from the National Renewable Energy Lab, Todd Borger with TJB Consulting Engineering, Peter Vitale also with Modern West, we also have Mike Morgan, an attorney that has represented airports and businesses surrounding airports for over 25 years to answer FAA and airport related questions. And Chris McGranahan from LSC, who is our transportation engineer. This talented team of design professionals is working together to implement Derek's vision. We have a short video that tells the story of Modern West and staff, now's the time to play the video. Just a sec, I wanna make sure we have computer sound as well. Can you hear that? Yes. You can design and build an amazingly beautiful architectural masterpiece. And if there is no human element and soul invested into that, you feel an emptiness. All of the different building types and experiences I've had for going on 30 years here, it's all being culminated into this project. Modern West is a new way to do land development. 
brings in a mix of uses, commercial, industrial, living, for art, play, expression, home. The intent and the goal of Modern West is to provide flexibility and opportunity to use spaces that you wouldn't traditionally use. We were really trying to capture some of this maker entrepreneurial spirit. We want to bring some of that old industrial quality and spaces that are more natural filling. Big openings, positioning trees, framing views to the mountains, getting to interact with the seasons. This project was really interesting from the beginning because I've worked with a lot of developers and Derek is a special type of developer. He's a very intentional person in, in everything he does. He's really, really engaged in the Longmont community because he lives there and he's concerned about the future for his kids, where they're going to grow up and live. Our partnership with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Rocky Mountain Institute will help us put sustainability at the forefront. They're a group of the brightest minds with building science in the world of innovation. Maybe too nerdy. Cost-effective decarbonization, it sounds like some kind of <laughs> horror movie. Rocky Mountain Institute is excited. We're playing a couple critical roles on the Modern West project. We don't get involved in a huge range, but really focused projects that are pushing the bounds of innovation. The Modern West team is composed of the biggest nerds in the energy space. And so our goal really is to put all of the right pieces in the right order so that the sustainability part is just embedded in the fabric of the development. The building sector is the single largest contributor of CO2 emissions in the world right now. A big part of our role is integrating all of these technologies and concepts and ideas in conjunction with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and making them cost effective. So I've been at NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, for 20 years. I get to work on projects that are really moving the industry forward, and Modern West is one of those. It's going above and beyond where most developments at this stage go. NREL represents an objective, science-based, third-party participant. What Modern West is attempting to do around zero energy communities is well aligned with our research trying to deploy and demonstrate large-scale net zero developments around the U.S. The way we look at net zero energy is a set of buildings that produce more on-site renewable energy than they use from the utility over the course of a year. In places like Longmont, where we have over 300 days a year of sunshine, we can take advantage of that to be our primary energy producing resource. And a lot of the research that's happening is how to best integrate those solutions into the grid. Because if everyone put solar on their building, in the middle of the day, the utility would not be able to absorb all that extra renewable energy. So having a small municipal utility that will work with developments like this as an active partner is a key opportunity for this type of project. Projects like this for the state are critical to prove that it can be done. And we have to figure out how to do it affordably. Studies have shown that net zero energy doesn't cost more upfront if it's done right. We've been learning lessons about live work for a while now. We find that if people have a space to go, like a maker space or a collaborative space, then they'll go there to work as well and it's more of a communal effort. With our live work row homes, we want to create a space where a micro business can thrive. So we thought it would be a great idea to start to provide these industrial bays that are a little bit bigger than something you would find traditionally. All of this commercial and light industrial use envelops the residential portion of the site. From a utility perspective, the mixed use amenities that it has on site, they're quite complementary in when they use energy over the course of the day. The live work component also helps build community. When you have artists and entrepreneurs and makers living together, it creates a spirit of vibrancy and aliveness. You think there's not a place like this in the region. It's all about the community here. You want your privacy, but you want to be part of the community. So we have multifamily buildings. They're all connected by these green spaces and pathways in a more pedestrian-friendly environment. And so the Container Collective itself is about creating a space to gather. We were able to take this really narrow strip and integrate these two ideas, tiny homes and community garden, a shared common interest. You oftentimes don't see art woven into projects. So that's where Modern West is unique as well. It's more on a human level. The materials are going to be pretty raw in nature, concrete, steel, and wood. We can actually design buildings specifically for certain age groups. We want to appeal to Generation Z all the way up to baby boomers. The Modern West site meets a lot of the guiding principles that are laid out in the Envision Longmont plan. And that's kind of where we found our alignment with what Longmont's trying to do. Affordable housing, we're going to create economic development, green space. The idea is to preserve what's succeeding in Longmont right now and to provide direction for the future. 
creation of smaller production facilities is a need that Longmont sees. How can we leverage the opportunities in this community to support Longmont Power's goals of clean, reliable energy? The grid in the U.S., there's a lot of municipal utilities that are asking the exact same questions. How can we decarbonize our grid and our buildings in unison? Modern West sits just east of Vance Brand Airport, and we're on a flight path. We have to be mindful of that relationship and partner with the airport. We've actually designed our buildings to relate to the air traffic. With the intention being that everybody that lives and works in this community is going to celebrate the airport and not think of it as a nuisance. Anytime you have lots of solar systems by an airport, it's always a challenge, right? Concerns about glare from planes being able to see the runway. That being said, you can do modeling to prove when that would happen and line that up with where the sun is, where the solar is, what type of film the solar panels have. Most of the air traffic is in a landing pattern, so it's more of a quiet relationship than a takeoff. So it's actually pretty enjoyable to be sitting there and watching a plane fly over. We're working on the fringe of innovation here. This is a place that I would want to live, that I want my kids to live, and this is a place that really fosters the sustainability values that I cherish. We're hoping that Modern West becomes a pilot project for new ways to design and develop, but I want to feel that. It adds a level of human connection and soul. Now we'll switch to a PowerPoint presentation and go through the criteria and components of the project. So can we have, there we go. We talked about these key elements of the team. Next slide. So every time I see this film, I'm reminded how fortunate we are to have a landowner who has a vision and is willing to gather the resources and follow through to implement it. This site is located in the middle of the mixed use neighborhood in this part of the community. Uh, we're here this evening to ask for your recommendation of approval to amend the Modern West Concept Plan to bring it more into alignment with the mixed use employment designation on the land use plan and the mixed use employment zoning on the property. The amendment will update the framework on the site to allow for creation of a new high quality energy efficient mixed use development that will provide a transformative space for community benefit within the city of Longmont. Next slide. This project, this location is identified as an area of change in Envision Longmont and areas of change are specifically noted to target future development, intense development, and they've been noted as a place where the community can. Ms. Brunk, you, uh, you suddenly went muted on us. So I'll need you to back up a little bit. How far back? Uh, you were talking about uh, areas of change. Areas of change. Yes. Okay, so we're still on the right slide. Yes. So again, this site is identified as an area of change in Envision Longmont, and those areas are specifically designated as like locations for future development and where intensity of development will benefit and be desirable in our community. Um, the proposal fits into the growth framework for Longmont and will create places for people that will promote a sense of community, provide an opportunity for people to live, work, play, connect, and meet their daily needs. Next slide. This site is also located in the context of centers and corridors as identified in the Envision Longmont plan. We are close to the airport road and Nelson Road major corridor and the connections that will add as we develop the property, we'll fit this site into the grid. It seems like it's out in the middle of nowhere there, there in the middle of farmland now, but as the transportation improvements are in, uh, installed, it'll fit into that framework. It's also located 
close to centers and transit within the community. Next slide. As Brian said, the original uh, concept plan for this property was a, a one use and light industrial and was based on the prior zoning of BLI. Adoption of the envisioned land use mixed use employment designation and the mixed use zoning will allow us to create a project that's much more in alignment with the comprehensive plan. It'll allow for sustainable and resilient project to provide a mix of uses and businesses, allow for on-site residential, provide community benefits and create a supportable density within walking distance to transit and multi-use bike and pedestrian networks. This will be one component to add an appropriate mix of uses within this portion of the mixed use neighborhood in this part of Longmont. Next slide. This is our concept plan. And you know, this project is a poster child for integrated mixed use development. We have flexible light industrial space for existing and startup businesses, live work and maker spaces to support small business entrepreneurs and artists and homes for residents of all ages and incomes. The neighborhood is designed to create and foster community connections as Derek talked about in the film. And all of this takes place in the context of an energy efficient, sustainable project. The mix of uses include light industrial, commercial and residential. 63% of the site will be the primary uses and 37% of the site land area will be dedicated to the secondary uses. This combination of uses supports job creation and economic development and will add diversity to the housing stock in this portion of Longmont. In addition, the, lobby, the uses will all be interconnected both on the site and to the community at large with pedestrian and bicycle connections and to the transit system in Longmont. Next slide. This just kind of show where we are. The, the mixed use designations there are properties that are annexed and zone mixed use. And you can see where we are relative to the grid with airport to the west, Nelson Road to the south, Rogers Road to the north and Hover over on the east. Next slide. This slide demonstrates how the site will be connected to the Longmont grid with the new transportation. So there along the north edge of the property is Meadowbrick Parkway and that will link Rogers Road to Hover Road eventually. And in the short term, it'll link the parkway to Nelson via Anderson Road. And then there's also a north-south road along the western edge of the property that will also provide a future connection. Next slide. This is how our project kind of fits in and was designed relative to the system. So the site is designed with the non-residential uses adjacent to the collector. So you see the commercial and the light industrial and then industrial wraps around the eastern edge of the property and the southern edge of the property. So residential uses are in this kind of in the center and will be accessed internally. So the main access will be into the light industrial project and those residential and commercial uses will be integrated with a trail system. You can see the yellow line that will connect us down to Nelson Road and then into Lycan's Gulch, which gets us into the overall pedestrian and bicycle network within the city. Next slide. We're so excited to be working with NREL as part of the project team on this site. Their role for NREL and Rocky Mountain Institute inform the concept design for the property. The letters in your packet from Shanti Pless and Cara Carmichael outline their respective roles of NREL in the design team. NREL also included this project in their recently published a guide to energy master planning of high performance districts and communities. So this is part of getting us into the national spotlight for Longmont as far as being on the cutting edge. The concept plan establishes a site layout to support passive solar site design, allow for integrated integration of both active and passive solar access. So not only do we have the buildings lined up so they work for panels, we also have the massing and layout so that we work for natural light on the property for both the businesses and the homes. Shanti Pless from NREL is here this evening to answer questions about NREL's ongoing role in the project. Next slide. 
The Rocky Mountain Institute is also part of our design team. And the gift here is that Derek brought NREL and RMI into the process at the very beginning so that we're not trying to figure out how to do it later because we didn't look at it at the front end. We've also had initial conversations with Longmont Power and Communications. RMI will continue to provide technical process and scaling support as we move forward to design and develop the property. We have a unique opportunity in Longmont because we have our own utility grid to collaborate with LPC and the Platte River Power Authority to develop a project that can serve as an example of how to integrate on-site renewable energy into the power grid. RMI will continue to help the team look toward how this project can be scaled up and create a replicable model for collaboration with local energy providers and to achieve grid interactivity. And Car Carmichael is here again from RMI this evening to answer any questions you have about that component of the project. Next slide. Okay, here we are at the airport influence zone. So the site is located in the middle of the mixed use neighborhood to the south and east of the airport. And again, Brian showed you that oval that shows up on the plan. So first and foremost, everything that happens on this property will be in compliance with the city and FAA safety regulations in place at the time the property is developed. We understand that the airport influence area, is, area overlay is there to protect and encourage the ongoing operation of the airport. Next slide. We took a proactive approach with the FAA and um, looked at both land use relative to the airport and, and what kind of land uses are compatible relative to the airport and safety factors. So the analysis shows that the site meets the FAA standards regarding land use in vicinity of the airport. And the request for an evaluation, we actually sent the, a request for them to look at the tallest possible building on the property as close to the airport as it possibly could be on the site. And with that, the FAA looked at it and determined that there would be no hazard to air navigation. Now that is a snapshot in time. So this will continue to be part of the analysis as we proceed through the process. So every time we look at this site, we'll revisit that FAA airspace designation and the city of Longmont's airport overlay zone as we develop the property. So again, all future development will comply with FAA standards and Longmont standards regarding the airport overlay zone. Next slide. It's our job to show that we meet the review criteria. So I'm gonna go through the highlights of these. There, um, there's a letter from the applicant in your packet from Aaron Bagnell and the staff analysis of the re review criteria, which clearly demonstrate that we comply, but I'd kind of like to hit the highlights. So the proposal meets the common review criteria as outlined in 1502.55 as shown in the letter. And we further the goals as established in the mixed use employment envision Longmont land use to embrace compact and efficient pat pattern of growth, promote sustainable mix of land uses, focus on development in corridors and other areas of change, integrate land use and transportation planning to enhance the overall quality of life in the city and protect and conserve Longmont's natural resources and environment. And this site is specific to sustainable development practices, creation of workspaces that are walkable and interconnected and mixed use employment areas that actually promote that higher density mix of uses that we looked at when we updated the Envision Longmont plan. Again, a concept plan is the basic framework. So this will continue to bring more detail. We'll be back with a preliminary plot for you to look at this again. But things like connections to the transportation grid, connection to the utilities in the area, connections to the multimodal transportation system, all of those things are illustrated on the concept plan and will be continue to be integrated into the project as we move forward. Street, streets, transportation, all those things are part of the plan as we go forward. Next slide. There's also some specific review criteria for concept plans. 
As the site develops, transportation and utilities will be linked to the city system. Pedestrian bicycle links will also connect to the city's multimodal network. Transportation and utility systems have adequate capacity to serve the proposed uses. No adverse impacts to adjacent properties have been developed. Um, as Brian said, we provided a habitat conservation plan for submittal as part of the application process and no significant environmental resources were identified on the property. That said, the applicant will follow the recommendations regarding migratory and nesting birds as outlined in the staff recommendation as we move forward to develop the property. Next slide. There are also re review criteria for specific standards for secondary uses. So this site is not located within a residential district. However, local internal access will be provided to the residents within the property. So they will front onto that local street, but access will be internal to the site. The secondary residential uses are specifically contemplated in the, and allowed in the mixed use employment zone and will meet the standards as outlined in 1502. The proposed secondary uses will not substantially diminish the availability of land within the surrounding underlying zoning district. In this proposal, land devoted to primary use is 63% of the property and land devoted to the secondary use is 37% of the property. They'll all be interconnected through that grid of, of streets and green spaces, but the overall mix gives deference to the primary use as established in the, in the zoning. Next slide. We're back to the airport. So again, we understand the restrictions regarding glare and light and all those things. All those things will be continue to be addressed as we move forward to develop the property. And I can't say it enough times, we are conscious of the airport and understand that everything that happens on the property has to be compatible with the airport, safe for pilots using the area, not noisy for the people who live there and meet the height standards as established in the zone. As a property develops, it'll comply with city and FAA standards. The applicant will provide a navigation easement and continued analysis will ensure that the proposal is compatible with the airport and will not compromise ongoing operations. Next slide. This project also has the ability to support several key elements of the city council's current work plan. So goal B1, as the site de develops, it will add diversity to the housing stock in Longmont. Goal B3, the partnership with NREL, RMI, and LPC has the potential to put us at a nationally recognized level for a scalable approach to integrating the grid with on-site renewable energy. Goal B4, as the site develops, we'll continue to expand our collaborative efforts to include local schools and higher education to provide education opportunities to expand the skills of our workforce. Goal B5, toward our renewable energy goals, integration of renewable energy and the potential to be a model of how this type of collaborative effort can inform other land development projects in Longmont and other communities. And again, that piece that's scalable so that we have an opportunity to change the way we do business in Longmont as we continue to develop. And truly all elements of the plan support a healthier climate for future generations and will help inform how we can better adapt to the impacts of climate change as we move forward. Next slide. Again, our discussion this evening and application materials in your packet demonstrate that the application as presented complies with the applicable criteria as outlined in 1502055, 1502060A3, 1504030A1, 1503050A5. And we respectfully request that you forward the Modern West Concept Plan Amendment to City Council with a recommendation for approval. Our team is here to answer your questions. We're excited to be able to talk to you this evening and we thank you for your time. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Brunk. Um, 
I think uh, just uh, because it takes us so long to get callers into our system, let's go ahead and start that process for the public hearing uh, part of this. Um, and then of course, after that, we will have questions from the, from the commission. So um, Erica, if we could put the slide up for the call-in information, that'd be great. <clears throat> um, as you can see on your screen from home, if you want to make comments about this project, uh, please dial 1-888-788-0099. When prompted, enter the meeting ID 831-5380-9801. And when asked for your participant, participant ID, press pound. When we're ready to hear public comment, we will call on you to speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record and will be allowed five minutes to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. To do this process takes us five minutes. So we'll take a five minute break and come back and see who we have. Thanks. Once again, folks, if you are joining us to speak on the Modern West Concept Plan Amendment, item agenda six on tonight's agenda, uh, please dial the number on your screen, enter the meeting ID, and please remember to mute the live stream. We will call you by the last three digits of your phone number, and then you will have to state your name and address for the record, and you will have five minutes to speak on item six.
So Erica, I think that's five minutes and uh, tell us whether we had anybody call in, please. We do not have any callers at this time, Chairman. Okay, all right, thank you very much, Erica. Uh, I will close the public hearing part of this and we will go to discussion and questions from the commission. Anybody want to kick us off out of our commissioners there? Commissioner Flig. Um, thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I was looking at the annexation agreement and um, it said that each initial um, purchaser signs an airport disclosure agreement. And although you're having the first buyers sign that disclosure agreement in addition to disclosure, yes, there is an airport nearby with the minimum How will subsequent owners know this? Will they also, are they also covered um, by this disclosure statement? Shouldn't there be a way in all of this that um, the airport disclosure also accrues to each subsequent owner of a property so that they still have the same process so that we're not caught later on, say 10, 15, 20 years down the way and we have the fire of the airport going and suddenly someone says, well, the noise is just, just awful and I wanna take measures and so on and so forth. Maybe this is a question for a... Okay, so... Commissioner Shurnack, could I add something about that? Sure, yes, please do. Ms. So the, those little plat notes are tough, and I agree with um, Commissioner Flagg. The, the thing that we're going to also have on this property is that navigation easement. So that navigation easement will come up in the title work with every person who purchases a, a piece of property or comes to live here. I also think that the part about celebrating the airport as part of the site design and making sure that people who come into the community to look for a place to live will understand that the airport's there because there'll be elements of the design on site that celebrate the airport will help people understand that they're in the location of an airport, you know, and call me crazy, but when your road starts on airport road before you get to your front door, there's a reason to think there might be an airport in the neighborhood. <laughs> Commissioner Flake, follow up? So the follow up I have is, you say it's in the closing document? It'll be in the title work. It'll in be the in the title, title commitment. So will there be then a note on each deed that will ride with the deed? Um, title work, every time you buy something, you get a title commitment. And so I that understand. easement will run with the land. So every piece of property that is sold or purchased on that property will affect that easement. And I'm going to ask the attorney, Mike Morgan, to maybe chime in about that. Thank you. Well, Barbara, I think you've covered it beautifully. Uh, every purchaser will get the title commitment and each of the, uh, 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 exception documents, and one of those documents will be uh, a full copy of this navigation easement. So each each purchaser will be subject to it and will have notice of it very clearly. And Mr. Morgan, just to be clear, so I understand, so as Commissioner Flake was saying, say 75 years down the road, somebody, uh, the 10th buyer of, of a property in this goes to close, that title company would be handing out the, uh, uh, the navigation easement for them to sign off on uh, for the 10th time. Yes, those, uh, those go all the way back. They, it runs with the land, which means it goes on forever unless there's some agreement with the city to, for some reason, vacate it. For instance, uh, if the airport goes away for some reason. Well, okay. Other than that, it remains of record. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions, discussion? Uh, Commissioner Pullen. Barb, I have some uh, questions about the size, uh, number of stories of the buildings for each of the commercial, industrial, and mixed use residential, what you're anticipating for those? I would ask Aaron Bagnell, who is our uh, architect, 
to talk through that conversation. Yeah, hi, um, Aaron Bagnell. I, there's, there's a max of four stories that are, that's allowable in this district. Um, we are, site design has a variety of heights and story levels that are associated. We step down to the airport or the, the Northern local Collector Road. So it, the, to answer your question, it varies and the maximum will be four stories tall. Some of them what will be three, some of them will be two. What do you anticipate for the mixed use residential? That right now is planned for four. Okay. Uh, and the, the, oh, go on. I was just gonna say that based on analysis that we did with NREL, those buildings will step to provide sunlight. I guess my, my one concern is that by the looks of this then, the properties on the west side are going to be the tallest taller buildings because those i believe will be taller than the light industrial um i was wondering why you wouldn't then reverse or why didn't you think about reversing light industrial and mixed use so that you go to taller buildings the further away from the airport that that you are because i'll tell you the one concern i have is mixed use or well, residential buildings um, by close to the airport. That's that's my one concern with this project. And and that concern it lies in the height, or is there other in, is there other concerns too? It, in the height and in the density. And and I think that's one of the reasons why when we first approved this a couple of years ago, and was light industrial, that the thought was that light industrial was not as dense of a um, a zoning as might, let's say, residential might be. So I, I guess it's both the height and the fact that it's a, a, what I would consider a, a denser zoning. Okay, um, I, think, I think what our response needs to be for that is that there, all, of, all of the safety measures that are in place with the FAA and the city regulations will be met by, the, by every building. So there's already a lot of measures in place around the airport. So the concern for height shouldn't really be an issue in this location because we already meet all the regulatory requirements. Can I add one more thing to that conversation? Yes. I think a couple of things. When we looked at this last time and it was just light industrial, it's because the city had not already contemplated adding mixed use employment to the mix of developments within the community. And when we started through the Envision Longmont, truly everything we did added density to the community with the idea that we're gonna have a compact urban form to be the most energy efficient and the most, um, the best stewards of the land and the resources that we have. So I think that when Envision Longmont designated this part of Longmont at this location, it anticipated density. So if it's residential or industrial or mixed use, all of those uses are allowed at the density on the underlying zone on this property. So I think that the goal to make it integrated mixed use needs to add those people into the neighborhood to give it life. I mean, if you go to any light industrial place that is a single use place and go there at six o'clock at night, it's a desert. And so the opportunity to include people at this level of density on this site, it will give it life and promote those goals as established at Envision Longmont. I, I completely understand your concern. And the other piece we have is NREL looking at how we design these buildings to make sure that they are well, it's a tight envelope, so it's not a noise issue. Does that help? Not really, huh? A little, a little bit. Okay. I mean, I did, you know, really, I, the, the, main, the main thing that I'm trying to wrap my head around is that an uh, area that's close to the airport that we're putting in uh the residential buildings and that's the thing that i'm trying to get my head around and 
and that causes me pause with this. Outside of that, I love the project. If, if, if this was at some other place further away from the airport, I would just absolutely love this. It's just because it's so close to the airport, over the runway zone, that's the issue that I have that I'm contemplating on, so. Um, Commissioner Height. Thank you, Chairman Shernick. Um, my concern is a little bit more pedestrian. Um, first, probably for DRC staff, the Anderson Self Storage Facility to the east, um, I recall in one of our approvals of a self storage area or a storage area that something, and it may have been this facility, there were outbuildings that needed to be torn down because they had some mini industrial activities taking place in them, uh, then they're going to be rebuilt. Does anybody know for sure whether or not this Anderson storage facility, which where I think RVs are being stored next door, is that facility? Brian, do you know? Uh, Commissioner Height, I don't know for certain. Barb might be able to respond to that because she worked on this project. Um, Commissioner Height, we did come and talk to you about the Anderson RV storage. And since that conversation, we're still in the process of finishing the PUD development plan to bring it into compliance with what was approved at the concept plan level. But there were some buildings that were removed as part of that application. That's been done. The, they took down the buildings that were going to be removed and built the buildings, the new um, storage buildings that were going to be included. And so when you go by that site, you'll see that the plan pretty much looks like the plan as approved. It's still in the DRC process and it's because it's on my desk. I can tell you. Sure. But that's what factors into my concern, which is specifically that the environmental assessment for this property was done in 2017 when it was originally proposed for a concept plan. It seems that possibly that environmental assessment might be a little stale. Um, Barb, maybe you know, um, in connection with the demolition of these buildings, you know, was it near the west boundary of the Anderson storage facility, i.e. adjacent to this area? No, the, the, the self store, the things that came down were internal to the site. And that site also prepared and submitted an environmental assessment as it went through the process at the consent plan amendment. There were no environmental, um, I don't remember any environmental reasons that that site wasn't okay. They were just, they just didn't function well for the property. That's why they were taken down. It wasn't that they were a hazard. It was that they didn't um, integrate into the plan of the RV storage on the site as it was approved. They were old buildings that just, they were there, but they didn't function as part of the approval. So they were removed and replaced with those um, metal buildings with the shed roofs to put RVs in. I do recall that uh, there was, they were gonna be replaced, but my recollection is somewhat different that there was some type of mini industrial activity that I just remember as being a little funky. So- There was a welding that, that, shop there. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Possibly. Um, so that was question number one. Question number two is um, the panhandle portion of this property, this the southern narrow, and, and it's actually, I think identified as parcel two, and I think the concept plan, um, is that a separate parcel? Is it an easement or is it actually owned in fee by the, by the owner? It's a fee simple part of the property. Okay. So now, as I look, it's as the I look, handle of our panhandle. It's the panhandle. Yep. Yeah. I understand in looking at, you know, there's a, there's a new road coming into the North Meadowbrook drive. There's a new, collector that looks like possibly it ends, but it's just gonna be on the west boundary of the property. Um, and in your concept plan, it looks like it, it, those two roads add up to possibly providing five different access points to your property. I note that it's identified as possibly emergency access, the panhandle. Um, and I think it was also identified as um, a multimodal path. Um, my question is, the neighboring properties to the south, the Alls House properties on the southeast corner, the Schilling property to the northwest corner, their access or the future development of those parcels um, might be limited in the ability for those parcels to access Nelson Road, especially as Nelson becomes 
much more busy and access points to major um, thoroughfares becomes more limited. Is there any, and now this goes back to staff, possibly to transportation, is there any understanding of the impact of this connector piece, um, possibly limiting the future development and access um, to Nelson Road of uh, these other parcels, the, the, the shilling parcel and the all house parcel? Ryan. So, um, I don't know, Caroline, do you have any comments on that before I wade into this? Um, so, I guess maybe to answer some general questions. So, most of the access to this property is to the north on the future east-west collector, Mountain Brook Drive. So, they're, the applicant is proposing to build that from Rogers Road to Anderson. Um, and that will also be built even further east by the Mountain Brook development to Dray Creek Drive. There was on the concept plan a local road north south on the west edge of the property that was proposed to be completed by others with development. Um, I know in the traffic study it was modeled as a full movement um, given its proximity um, out on an arterial and proximity to Airport Road as well. Given spacing, it's possible it could be maybe movement restricted in the future as well. But um, as far as access to those other two parcels, I know that our code does prohibit creating any parcels parcels that are undevelopable. And I guess Brian might have to chime in on that. But um, while our code does say you generally can't take direct access off an, off an arterial, you can if it's the only means of access. So I would just add to that, that the, if you're looking at those two parcels, one, the one to the west of that little panhandle will have access off that local street someday, that north-south local street. And those parcels are question? existing. That's, that was gonna, be my, that was gonna be my question. Um, is there access from the Schilling property onto that road to this uh, residential connector that's unnamed, the, the panhandle? Once it would annex, I mean, that's little piece of property that goes north, the pan, the handle to our property is not planned to be a, a public street. It's planned to be used for a combination of maybe tiny homes or some kind of community garden and pedestrian access and, 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 and a creative use of it so it isn't just left aside. But that is not a, a, a full movement access onto Nelson Road. So the only reason that vehicles would come off, vehicles would come off of that on Nelson Road would be for emergency access. So I'm not sure who owns what piece, but as if those properties were annexed, they would need to figure out how they get access at the time they get annexed. And I don't believe anything we're doing as part of this application changes that. Brian, would you like to chime in? Sure, Commissioner Height. Uh, I mean, I think the parcel that's on the west side of that panhandle, uh, obviously, whenever and if they decide to go through the annexation process and annex and develop, they would have access to that local street connection down to Nelson Road that run, that's currently shown on the concept plan running along the west side of the modern west property that would extend down to Nelson Road. The two parcels that are unannexed on the east side of the panhandle that are south of the modern west and the Anderson self storage or the RV storage parcels, you know, we'd have to take a look at those ideally. Um, you know, we'd want them to perhaps uh, take access over to uh, Anderson Street to the east uh, as their primary access. Um, and so that's one option in terms of a second means of access we'd have to take a look at different options, maybe tying into this emergency access down the panhandle and or a separate emergency access out to Nelson Road if there wasn't another feasible option. 
And then we could also potentially for this parcel at the southeast, kind of the east side of the panhandle, look at some type of integration or connection into the street system in the modern west property as well. So it isn't isolated. If, if someone could pull up possibly the concept plan, um, I know Ms. Brunk's presentation included it. I have it up on my screen and I have some questions, I guess, regarding what's designated on that thing. Is there an ability to pull that up? Yeah, let me see. Sorry, a little challenged at the moment. Hopefully you guys can see that yet. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, maybe you can blow it up, but the panhandle, as I look at it, is identified as being residential connector. Is that not a description of a road? That's not a, I thought that was gonna be part of the street system to this subdivision. Is that incorrect? Well, had, it's not incorrect. I mean, we've had some conversations and they're not fully flushed out in terms of what the uses might be on that panhandle. I know as, as uh, Barb mentioned, some options that have been discussed are perhaps in addition to an emergency access pedestrian trail connection. You know, we've talked about ideas of, for example, small, smaller scale or residential. Uh, I'm not convinced yet that that's gonna fit on there, but other options might be uh, community gardens and or perhaps alternative energy systems, maybe you know solar panels or something along those lines. So I think we wanna to continue to have that conversation with the applicant about what's the, the best use of that area as we go through the process for preliminary subdivision, plat and site planning. Okay, um, then on the road, the, the future road, unnamed road on the west side of the, the development, it appears to go along the section line. Um, is it anticipated that that road will actually at some point in time connect to Nelson? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Yes, it will. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think that answers my problem, answers my issue with respect to the, the showing property, which I think Ms. Brunk was pointing out to me. Um, and then with respect to the Alls House property on the southeast corner and whatever's next to it, they're going to find some other access point, maybe through Anderson Road further to the east. Is that your understanding? I mean, it looked like possibly to so, me the you know, Go ahead. Commissioner Hyde, one option, there are several options. One would be obviously get a connection over to Anderson Street on the, to the further to the east. Another option would be to, if they need emergency access, to tie into this emergency access in the panhandle. Another option might be to have a link into the modern west development that would provide access up to the collector street on the north side of the property and or the local street on the west side of the property. Okay, I just wanna make sure that we weren't going to leave somebody landlocked, um, especially with Nelson Road becoming more and more of a major road and the access points, the driveway cuts are, are gonna be prohibited. Um, and I want to make sure that- Yeah, ahead. certainly. I mean, obviously this will get further refined and the commission will have another opportunity to review this with the preliminary subdivision plat. So you'll have a chance to look at street connections um, in more detail, obviously, with the preliminary plat. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for your indulgences. I'm myself going to still be concerned about the stale environmental report. But otherwise, um, as Commissioner Poland identified, like the project. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Commissioner Teta. Okay. Um, like uh, Commissioner Height, I think I have a lot of accessibility and transportation issues, but um, to echo some of Commissioner Pollan's concerns, I thought uh, 
given that we have the airport manager, David Slater, available, I wondered if we could, we could bring him in. Sure. Um, do you have a question for him specifically? About, yes, how he feels about the compatibility of the residential specifically and the density with the airport. Mr. Slater. Uh, Chair and commission members, David Slater, I'm the airport manager for the city of Longmont. Um, the, there is a technical clarification, I guess. If you ask an air, uh, FAA planner if the residential portion would be compatible land use, which is an FAA grant assurance that the city is required to uphold, the answer would be no. Um, historically though, between the plat notices and going forward with this navigation easement, um, we've historically kind of had a pass, given, given a pass by the FAA, um, some of the closer residential. Um, there's no way to tell what kind of determination or response on that, that that we would have, but we have talked to them about other developments. Um, a little bit about this one, and we did inform them that we were going to be doing a navigation easement, but technically it's not compatible land use with the residential, but we're, we're anticipating a, a pass from the FAA on that with the uh, navigation easement. Um, Commissioner Teta, do, do you mind if I do a follow-up question? Not at all. Okay. Um, Erica, uh, are you able to bring up our, our packet and go to uh, page 130 of our packet and put that up onto screen share? Hmm, I don't, I mean, I have the um, Modern West PowerPoint that has 28 pages, but I don't have any packets necessarily. Ah. Maybe Jane can chime in. Yeah, there's, because page 130 of our packet has a very, it, it's actually, a, it's a drawing from Sofer Sparn from the architects. Um, and it shows the runway and it shows uh, the direct extended line from the center of the runway. And then it, but uh, then it shows uh, a trapezoidal set of lines. Uh, Chairman? extending beyond that center line of the runway. And so just with that kind of uh, in your mind, and I'm sure Mr. Slater, you're, you're very familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, those lines that go beyond and, and extend to the left and to the right of the center line of the runway, um, that's it. That's what we wanna look at. Um, you can see that the upper extended line is crossing over the soon to be developed residential area of Mountain Brook. You see that the lower extended line uh, barely clips the, uh, the corner of Stonebridge Townhomes, which is new, but it definitely goes over Schlegel development, which has been there for decades. And then the neighborhood to the, to the east of Schlegel. So my question, Mr. Slater is, is um, you're saying that this is not a slam dunk with the FAA, but is given how much other residential is already within that, that broader zone, um, is that um, giving you the confidence that, that, that we would get a yes? The, the navigation easement is, is kind of what I'm putting my bet on. And I, I feel like that they would be happy with that since historically they have been. Um, okay. I just don't trust that I could give any kind of guarantees. Now, as far as what you're looking at there, that, that appears to be the um, approach to parts or surfaces and has more to do with airspace than noise um, or compatible land use, um, which as uh, Barb mentioned, they, they did um, take a proactive approach with the FA and, and did receive a letter of no objection as far as the airspace goes. So that, that portion of it is not as much of a concern, but within the airport influence zone, pretty much anywhere, uh, especially with that close of a proximity to, to the runway, um, I think that's what the FA looks at when, with compatible land use as far as residential. Uh, 
they don't really like schools or churches either, but um, in, in, in that uh, compatibility issue. Um, the industrial, commercial, light industrial, things like that is, is very much compatible land use. Um, okay. It's just the residential is the only thing that we had a concern with, but with, with that navigation easement, I am hopeful and, and feel pretty confident that the FAA would give us a pass with that. Okay, and one more follow-up question for you, Mr. Slater. So as we're looking at this drawing, the center line of the runway we, we see goes directly over um, the parcel that is just north of Rogers Road, the curve, you know, so, so you have airport, the intersection with Rogers and, and that curved part of Rogers. We had a project and yes, exactly, thank you, Erica. Um, we had a project in front of us a couple of years ago that was for like a, um, uh, a set of storage units that, that would be built on that, that parcel. And we had, um, we had pilots uh, who came to our meeting and said, that's a very dangerous place to build uh, because as we take off, you know, if something goes wrong, we don't have a place to, to land safely you know, or to bail out. Is, in your opinion, um, given how much further away this project is from that, and we have no pilots here this evening saying, hey, I'm really nervous about this. Are we in a much safer position with the project in front of us in terms of something going wrong for an airplane that takes off? I think with the, the easements that are already in place, as well as the, the um, it's not the collector road, but the one that comes off of Rogers in the curve, uh, being in line, you know, I think that that is helpful and being further back than what the storage units were going to be is helpful. Um, it also gives them the opportunity to, to, to possibly uh, deviate so that they can avoid any residential or, or any building for that matter. But uh, I, th I think we're certainly better off than we were with the storage unit. Um, I'm sure that you're still gonna have a handful of people that would push back and, and make the same argument. Um, but, you know, I think we are better off than we were with the storage units. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Slater. Uh, back to Commissioner Teta. Sorry to take up your time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chairman Chernick. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Um, I do have another question. Uh, I believe this is uh, for Ms. Brunk. Um, uh, there was a letter in our packet from, from a, uh, uh, I think from the neighborhood meeting where they were wondering what some of the light industrial uses would be. And I think it was in your presentation I saw on the right hand side of one of your slides about four, four uses listed. One was um, uh, airport partners or partnerships or something like that. Can you give us a little bit of a vision as to what the light industrial uses might be? I can speak a little bit to it, but I think Aaron could also speak to it. I mean, what the, the goal is to have um, maker space so that as as new businesses, as an existing businesses, you know, we have lots of little businesses around town are working out of somebody's garage. And their next step is up to a, a place where there's an office or a home and a space big enough to build things in. And so we're thinking that it's th that it's going to be those kinds of things. Um, the reason we put in airport is because we're next to the airport. So if somebody's going to manufacture something or provide a, um, a complementary use of some kind of thing that the airport needs, this is a perfect location to do that. So we don't have any idea exactly who they're going to be, but the goal is to have a collaborative makerspace entrepreneurial place that allows flexibility in the size of those units. They're gonna have overhead doors, which is lacking in Longmont. And so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where there's a front office and a rear end that has a place to build things, that has a high ceiling and, and those kinds of things. So it would be a mix of uses. And um, 
you know, they'll each get a building permit. That'll be a little more refined as we move forward with the architecture and the site design. But I think that, again, that goal is makerspace to have businesses and entrepreneurs. You know, I also want to make sure that if you have specific questions regarding airport and FAA standards, Mike Morgan has had 25 years of working with the standards. So if, if you have a question about how we comply with the land use compatibility, I think those things are based on noise standards. And there's a letter in your packet from Mike that outlines that, but he can talk specifically to those things if anybody has those specific questions. Sorry to sidetrack, but I just want to make sure that if you want his voice in the room, it's available. Great. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thanks. More questions from the commission. Actually, I, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Goldberg. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Well, I think just to um, add a slightly different perspective into uh, to the discussion, um, while I appreciate the concerns um, of accessibility raised by Commissioner Height and the concerns around safety, uh, for both the pilots and uh, for the residents raised by Poland, Commissioner Poland and Commissioner Teta. Um, boy, I'm, I am favorable of this, pro of this project. Um, I think in our packet, it was revealed that it, it, for the most part, meets the review criteria. And as a result, uh, staff made the recommendation for approval. Um, Additionally, there wasn't a uh, any major pushback from neighbors. That's always a, a, a you know a welcome position to be in. So often we're uh, handling uh, far more phone calls on that public invited to be heard uh, that we didn't hear today. Um, given the cautious support by um, the airport manager uh, and referring to the likelihood of this um, meeting being approved by the FFA and and, and that the applicant has agreed to meet all the regulations that come along with being in this area. I sure think that this is, uh, you know, a forward thinking project, um, recognizing where it's located in the city um, and recognizing some of the challenges that come with that, of course, noise and, and other challenges of being near the airport. But I think at the same time, that's a little bit of a silver lining in that we have a, uh, the opportunity to have a project here and maybe what might be considered an undesirable part of town that is innovative, forward thinking, focused on sustainability, creative in a way that we don't see too often here. Um, and gosh, I think it aligns with our Envision Longmont. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to, you know, hear from the rest of the commissioner that we haven't heard from yet, or um, just wanted to drop that in and see where that takes us. Thank you, Commissioner Goldberg. Um, actually, uh, I'll second everything you've just said um, about this project. I, I, I think it's, um, I think the applicant is, is uh, not stretching it very much to say that this would uh, really put uh, Longmont on a national, even international stage as to how to, to do something like this uh, at a more of a district level, 16 acres. Uh, I mean, this is a big project. Um, I am curious um, because we have um, the consultant from NREL and also Ms. Carmichael from RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, uh, just tonight, I got my December issue of Architectural Record, and I was flipping through it before the meeting, and uh, and there was an article in it saying that um, something like half of the architectural firms that have uh, signed on to uh, Ed Masri's 2030 Net Zero Challenge um, are currently reporting that they can't come close to meeting it. Um, uh, to the current goals and the goals step up uh, in, in the next year or two, et cetera. So I'm, I'm wondering for, from Mr. Pless and Ms. Carmichael and, and maybe Ms. Bagnall as well, um, how, and I don't think this is necessarily tied to approval of, of, this, of this project, but, but since you're here, I just wanna kind of take, pick your brains and, and, and hear what you have to say. How, do, how does a project like this stay on track and actually hit net zero by the time it finishes build out. Because in this article that I saw, most of the architects were saying, 
the reason we couldn't hit ne our net zero goals were because of value engineering processes and, uh, and losing all of the, basically the intention that, that we started with. Would any of you care to chime in on that? <laughs> Sure, I, I'd be happy to start and Shanti, feel free to weigh in. Uh, Kara Carmichael from Rocky Mountain Institute. I think it's a fantastic question and um, we've been fortunate to be part of many projects um, over the years, my 20 year career have worked on a number of net zero energy and really aggressive ambitious projects. And I think what makes those successful, um, you know, the ones that do really succeed, knock it out of the park, is having a firm commitment from the very beginning, um, established in kind of the nature of the project through a strong leader. And I see that in Derek and a commitment from the whole team and the understanding of this is a core part of the project that we're building. Um, and so I, I feel like that intentionality and that motivation and that clarity and vision um, is there and has been there from the very start. And I think often Sustainability is an element that can be looked at, oh, we'll add it in later. And, and that just, you know, if you're gonna make it cost effective and, you know, solidify your commitment so that it isn't something that can be value engineered out, you know, at the late, at later stages, it needs to be there from the beginning. And I think value engineering, it's such a weird term because it's not any value and it's not engineering. Um, it's really just kind of a cost reduction measure and if you do integrative design properly, where you're actually designing an, an envelope for a building that is um, complementary to the mechanical systems that you're designing, which also complements kind of the grid and the infrastructure that, that you're adding, it works together as a system so that you can't just remove one piece, but it really is kind of orchestrated together. Um, so the solution is, optimized from that standpoint from the beginning. Okay. Shanti, what would? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, it's Shanti Plus here at NREL. Um, I think it's uh, something we work on uh, on the research side as well in terms of how decisions are made, how, um, uh, how the components uh, um, price out. I think uh, as those of us in the, you know, that have gotten solar coats for houses lately, right? That the, these costs of, of some of the more expensive systems that historically that were too expensive for owners or developers to afford that you know, might may have had aspirational goals but now when the when the you know the actual cost hit the budget uh just don't make it into the final project um those costs have come down significantly something like 80 percent cost reduction in the last eight years for solar in particular um wind and batteries as well electric vehicle you know charging infrastructure all these things are, are have pretty aggressive um cost compressions happening in the last five years that really make it approachable now more for, for projects that, that you know, in support uh, of these goals. And so I think, um, um, that, you know, as um, as an integrated team can approach this and, and with those additional, you know, cost con, um, compressions available now, I think uh, you'll, you'll see more and more able to do that. Um, I, and, you know, the, the design industry, I think, uh, maybe Aaron can jump in here and, and uh, from uh, from the architecture and these are architectural commitment, but I think the design the design community is ready to step up. I think it's the, when you have integrated teams all pointed towards this goal is when you can really um, get through those those kind of budget issues and cost you know and, and uh, extra cost issues that you know have plagued those teams in the past. Thank you, Mr. Plus, uh, Ms. Begnum. Yeah, thanks, Chairman Chernick. Um I would say that. Of course, budgetary constraints are always a concern, but what we have here and it's most important here is a dedicated owner. And that's, that's what makes me feel confident in this process and this team and the dedication that he's showing to this goal. I, I feel like that's something you don't get very often. So it's, it's a special thing and I feel like it's a good opportunity for the city of Longmont. Great, thank, thank you all for, for giving us kind of a bigger picture there as to how, how this can play out. Of course, um, you know, we're at a concept plan level. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, further stages uh, where more and more detail comes into play. Ms. Brunk? I just wanna add that, you know, we've been talking about how we're gonna make this work, how we're gonna make it pencil from the beginning. So everybody gets that. And part of how we got to such an integrated mix of uses is 
all of the combined uses help at pencil. So it, the project as a whole works financially, but if we start pulling out pieces of it, it starts to fall apart. So an integrated mixed use community is much more able to meet the financial performa than a single use project. So I, I think that needs to be part of this discussion. You know, Again, Derek has said from the beginning, I gotta be able to afford to build it. I know I need to do it. I gotta be able to afford to do it. And I can tell you that I've worked with a lot of people over the years. This applicant has his heart and a commitment to this project. And it's evident every time you talk to him. It just, you can see the twinkle in his eye when he talks about it and his commitment to the environment in everything he says. So I think that's the other piece about having it not fall apart at the end. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, other questions from the commissioners? I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, chime in and say that uh, I believe that the applicant has, uh, has shown in their presentation and in, in our, our packet, which we received, they have met the review criteria. Um, and uh, I believe that um, given that, I would like to make a motion to approve PZR 2020-8A, which would move this as a recommendation to city council with no conditions. For, uh, it's an approval with no conditions. Um, so motion on the floor to approve PZR 2020-AA, Commissioner Height. I will second that and add in that um, I do believe that it meets the criterion as a concept plan. I do have concerns which I reserve for later date about you know, the updating of an environmental assessment um, and my concerns regarding um, the impact to access of other properties in the future seems to have been addressed. So I'm in favor and second your proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a second. Uh, Commissioner Unaron, I saw you had your hand up. Oh, oh, you're going to second, okay. Do you wanna make some comments? I, okay. Well, uh, the only comment I was gonna make is that, you know, in terms of the proximity to the airport, there's a security issue. As long as that is addressed, the second issue is inconvenience. And then, you know, inconvenience for the uh, residents. But when you balance that with several items, the benefit this development is gonna bring to the land use of uh, long month by means of not doing a single use, but a really supportive mixed use. And plus all the sustainability items that is gonna save in the long term for the residences. That's a balance. And on top of that, I'm gonna add the views from that particular site. So actually it's a very desirable, you know, uh, uh, proposition. So with that, I think so many items are going to cancel out the inconvenience of the noise and other uh, items, as long as security uh, conditions are met. That's why I support the project and I was going to second, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Anran. Any further discussion? Commissioner Poland. Yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm going to vote against this just because I don't mind the mixed use. The thing that really still kind of gives me pause is the fact that there's going to be three and four story buildings, residential buildings that close, where in that area, we don't have anything close to that height. Um, and it's, I don't care about the noise. I understand the noise. People going there should understand the noise. I just worry about the safety of putting that kind of building that close to the airport. Um, Two-story buildings, I'd be fine with. Mixed use, I'm fine with. It, it's just that they're three and four stories and that's the thing that gives me pause. So um, just kind of want to explain why I'll be voting no. Okay. Um, other comments before we take a vote?
Okay, let's go ahead and vote on those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Okay, it looks like it's uh, all but uh, Commissioner Poland. Those against, raise your hand. Commissioner Poland is against. Any abstentions? I see no abstentions. So Jane, that is uh, passing six to one with Commissioner Poland uh, uh, opposing. And let's see, I need to read our announcement here. This item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you're unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear before council, please contact the planning division for further information at 303-651-8330. Okay, we have more items on our agenda, but uh, first I want to thank uh, the applicant and his entire team who came tonight to help us uh, work through this. Um, also, thank you to Caroline Michael and Brian Schumacher and David Slater, our city staff, uh, who supported us in figuring out uh, what's going on with this project. Um, so again, thank you very much. Um, next you. item on our agenda is item seven, which is our final call for the public invited to be heard. Uh, Erica, we need our slide up on the screen, showing the, the phone number, please. There we go. Um, please dial 1-888-788-0099. When prompted, enter the meeting ID 831-5380-9801. And when asked for your participant ID, press pound. When we're ready to hear public comment, we'll call you. We'll call on you to speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record, and will be allowed five minutes to speak. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. To get everybody who might call in. Oh, and this is for items that were not on tonight's uh, uh, agenda. So anything that was not in the item we just heard. Um, We'll take a five minute break to give people a chance to call in. We'll be back in five minutes.
All right, Erica, did we get anybody calling in? We did not, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. We'll close the, uh, the public invited to be heard. Um, next is items from the commission. I myself would like to uh, thank Erica Illingworth and uh, Jane Madrid for their help tonight. And of course, special thanks to Jane for all of her help uh, throughout the year. Um, we can't do it without you. So appreciate that. Um, and also want to wish everybody a uh, safe and healthy holiday season. Uh, let's get into 2021 in one piece. Um, uh, anybody else from the commission? No, okay. Um, any items from Council Representative Aaron Rodriguez? Thank you, Chair Schoenig. Uh, of course, as always, Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah and Happy Holidays to all of our commissioners, as well as the staff for the city of Longmont. You guys do great work and you provide so much as far as support uh, for the decisions we have to make at city council. So as always, thank you so much for your service and I will see you next year. Thank you so much. Um, any items from uh, planning director, um, Glenn Van Nenmoyga? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to mention that uh, last night the city council um, did reappoint a couple of alternate members. I think they're reappointment, but correct me if I'm wrong. So Selena Kohler um, was reappointed to December 31st of 2022. And then uh, Anna Lukachi um, was uh, reappointed for the same term. And then they appointed a new regular member, Jerry Boone, um, for December 31st, 2025 term. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. No. Uh, Commissioner Hyatt has been reappointed for his term. Commissioner uh, Jerry Boone has been appointed as an alternate. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say goodbye, folks. Wow. <laughs> I'm terribly <laughs> Thanks sorry. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, it, it's been fun, Commissioner Hyatt. <laughs> All right, well, um, Thank you, Glenn, and congratulations to Commissioner Kohler and Commissioner Lukacs and, um, and to our new alternate, uh, Mr. Boone, and to Commissioner Height uh, for his reappointment. Um, so, uh, Glenn, anything else from your desk? Um, we had a short meeting, um, I think it was on Monday, um, with Chairman Chernick, um, and it was suggested that perhaps, you generally, I think, have a kind of a work session at the first meeting in January. Um, and I think the idea was proposed that maybe we do a, um, uh, a relook at um, the open meetings laws and how that affects ex parte communication and certainly the planning commission. Um, I have talked to Teresa, I believe she is definitely up on board with that. So we'll start planning that um, January session straight away. And also enjoy your holiday. Great, thank you so much, Glenn. Um, and uh, anything else, Glenn? Is that it? I, no, I didn't sir. Even catch off. Okay. No, sir. All right. Okay. So the last item on our agenda is number eleven, which is adjournment. Um, seeing nobody opposed, we will adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Happy holidays, all. <laughs>